So as, as I was trying to decide on what to, what to share today, my mind was going through a lot of different things. I've been studying a lot of church history and things like that, but I didn't really feel like that was the right thing for today. Um, and so, but I didn't know what, what to bring. So um, I went to, went to bed on Thursday night, not really knowing what to, what to talk about today. And, uh, but I asked the Lord in my prayers to please, you know, show me something that we can discuss that would be edifying. And uh, that night I had a dream, and, and the, di- the dream doesn't have a, didn't have a lot of details other than I saw myself uh, teaching a class, and I don't think it was here, it was just teaching a class in some place I don't know. Um, and the topic was, uh, was opposition. And I, and I woke up and I thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know. And, and, uh, and I wasn't sure if it was a spiritual dream or, or just my own mind or what, but I decided to study that, and that's what, what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I looked it up, looked up all the words I could find in relation to that. And, and there's, there's a lot of great scriptures. And basically, I want it to be very conversational. It's not really a presentation. It's more of just, I'm going to put some scriptures up, and I'd like for us to discuss them. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, some, before we get into the actual opposition, I want to talk about a little bit about the nature of God and our status with God before we get into, into these details. So 1 Nephi 3, 33 to 35 tells us, it says, Therefore remember, O man, for all thy doings thou shalt be brought into judgment. Wherefore, if ye have sought to do wickedly in the days of your probation, then ye are found unclean before the judgment seat of God. So how many of you here have had doings that were not righteous? So we're all in big trouble, right? (laughs) Okay. So it says, if you have sought to do wickedly in the days of your probation, then you are found unclean before the judgment seat of God. And this is the one here that should scare us to death. And no unclean thing can dwell with God. So we've all sinned, and we're all unclean, and we cannot be with God in our current state. So we have to change, right? There has to be a change that happens. And um, so before you get to, before you lose hope, we'll go to the next one. So this tells us that we are, not only are we unclean, but we are the enemy of God. The natural man is an enemy to God. So if you just live your life and just sort of do whatever feels good to you, whatever feels natural or whatever, whatever fits into the society, you will remain in an, as an enemy of God. But here's the hope. It says, but, and this is out of Mosiah chapter 1, it says, but if he yieldeth to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man... And he becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. So there's our, there's our salvation, right? Through Christ. That's our only way. It's the only way we can be atoned. Through Christ the Lord and, and becometh, and here's the description of how we should become. Submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child doth submit to his father. And that's a tough one, you know, because sometimes the Lord does put things in our life that are not very savory. They're not very comfortable. And so that's kind of where, that's where this is, that's what this presentation or this, that's what this class is about, is realizing that opposition is necessary. That opposition in our lives is something good. And it's hard to think that way with our human thoughts. We want everything to be soft and comfortable and you know, you want to wake up every day and nothing's changed. We don't have to deal with death or loss or anything. We just want to, you know, live our lives and have fun and have a good retirement and, and then pass away happy. And, but that's, that's not going to get us from that state of being the natural man, being able to come back into his presence. And so this is a principle that I think we often, we often don't talk about. Even though the scriptures tell us to preach nothing but repentance, we, uh, you know, oftentimes it's, it's not comfortable to preach repentance. It's not comfortable to hear that I need to change, that I need to repent. I need to, something inside of me is ugly. I got to get that, got to get that sin out of me. And so, um, but I think after this presentation, hopefully, maybe you'll see opposition, you'll see trials, you'll see tribulation, you'll see those things, maybe in a little bit different light. So before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about God too, about his nature. So. This is something that just blows my mind about God, and that is is that he is meek. Now think about 
think about, you know, and meek, if you, if you don't know what necessarily that word means, it means like submissive, it means um, gentle, controlled, like often the, the actual Greek word that's used in this scripture um, is the same word that is used when you're, when you're talking about bridling a horse or training a horse to be, to be tame and docile. It's the same exact word. So, and here is God describing himself, Jesus is describing himself as meek and lowly in heart. You know, and to me, that's just that's not something I can wrap my head around. Because we, you know, in our world, the more power you get, the more wealth you get, the more, you know, that pride wells up inside of you. And it, you know, I can't imagine he's the God of the universe. He's the, he, he speaks and worlds come into being. And yet he is meek and humble. You know, and that, that just is a concept that blows my mind. And I love how the, the Book of Mormon des- describes this process. So in 1 Nephi 3, you've got, you've got Nephi, who has his, he, his father had this vision of the tree of life, you know, and the rod and all that. And so he asks, he wants to know, Nephi wants his own testimony. I want to know what my father saw. And so an angel comes to him and begins to share with him what his father saw and explaining what it all means. And so this is the angel speaking to uh, Nephi. And it says, and he saith unto me, knowest thou the condescension of God? You know, he's basically saying, do you understand how God is meek? Do you understand how God is going to lower himself into your world? And so Nephi says, and I said unto him, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. So he says, I know God loves me, but I don't really know much else. So the angel, and he said unto me, says, Behold, the virgin which thou seest is the mother of God after the manner of the flesh. So he shows her, he shows him a vision of Mary giving birth to Jesus and basically says, This is your God. This is the condescension of your God who took upon him flesh and came into this world. And that had to just blow his mind. You know, when you think about that, the God of creation chose to come down here and be a baby that wets his pants and cries and must be, you know, is completely helpless. You know, a baby needs everything. A baby can't even turn over. A baby needs everything. And he put himself in that fleshly body to pay the price for us. Anyway, it says, uh, And it came to pass that I beheld that she was carried away in the spirit, And after that she had been carried away in the spirit for a time, for a space of time, the angel spake unto me, saying, Look. And I looked and beheld the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. And the angel saith unto me, Behold, the Lamb of God, yea, even the Eternal Father. And that had to just be incredible to him. So now that we we understand that we are lost without him, and he is the God of creation, but yet he is humble and meek. Now let's talk about opposition. So, how many of you have ever been to a buffet? (laughs) And, And how many of you, after you eat at a buffet and you get your money's worth, do you feel like going out and having cheesecake? (laughs) No way, right? doesn't even look good. Well, there's actually a scripture that, that basically says the same thing. This is out of Proverbs. It says, the full soul loatheth in honeycomb. So here's this honeycomb. It's the sweetest, most delicious thing that, that, that they could eat in that time period. You know, and he says, the one that is full says, I don't even want that. Don't even give me that wonderful honeycomb. I, I can't. I, it's disgusting to me. I'm full. I'm stuffed. But the hungry soul Every bitter thing is sweet. So this, this hungry person had to experience the hunger before he realized how sweet everything is, even things that seem bitter that normally you may think of as bitter. But when you're hungry, I mean, have you been, star- been starving hungry and you go to eat at a fast food place and you're like, wow, this is like the best food I've ever had, you know, and it's just like McDonald's or whatever. But because you're so hungry, it just tastes great, you know. Okay, so, and that's just to show that kind of that it's about perspective, you know, understanding the perspective. So, 
So this is the first scripture that I found. And actually, the word opposition doesn't appear very often in scripture. It only appears really in the Book of Mormon. It appears once in the Bible and once in the Doctrine and Covenants, but it does not appear anywhere else. Um, and, and not in the right, not in this context. So this is, this is actually Lehi. He's talking to his sons, and he's on his deathbed. And he tells us, he's explaining to his sons the plan of salvation and, and how much God loves them. And they've made this journey across the ocean. They've all been suffering. You know, Jacob and Joseph are born in the, uh, during the journey. You know, they've known nothing but suffering. Living in a tent, living in the desert, almost dying on the ocean. I mean, you know, they're, they've suffered. They finally make it to the promised land, and now Lehi is on his deathbed. So he says, And to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man... After that he had created our first parents and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and in fine all things which are created, it must needs be that there was an opposition. Even, even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself, wherefore man could not act for himself save it should be that he were enticed by the one or the other. So if he had not had the option of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the, the bitter, if they had not had that option, it wouldn't know how wonderful the tree of life was. You know, in other words, so we've been in this life. We've experienced that tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's where we are. We're in that state right now. We're in a fallen state. We don't have God walking in our midst. We're not seeing angels every day. We're we're in the midst of the world and temptation and all this filth all around us. And so how sweet it will be, though, if we're able to leave this life and go into that next life with God and be in his presence, how wonderful that will be because we've tasted this bitter life, right? So you, Adam and Eve, had they only taken the, tree of, partaken of the tree of life, they just would have remained in their state of perfection and not had experienced what God had, how much God really loved them and what he'd done for them. And so in this case of the tree of life versus the, the, the um, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, they needed to have that contrast. There has to be that negative force to make the positive force. You realize that it's positive. You know, you don't realize it's positive. That's all you know. Um, I just this thought of this. This is kind of dumb. But there's a, in the cartoon, The Incredibles, um, there's a, the bad guy. He says, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I have kids, so I've seen it. Um, he says, uh, um, he goes, I'm going to make everybody super. He creates, he's creating all these like gadgets and stuff. And he says, I'm going to make everybody super. That way nobody will be. You know, and so he's basically saying if everybody has these powers, then no one's going to be powerful because we're all going to have it. You know? Well, that was the kind of the thing in the Garden of Eden. There had to be, if everybody was pure and righteous, then... They wouldn't realize. They wouldn't appreciate it. They wouldn't know what they had. But now we have the opportunity, because of what happened, we have the opportunity to understand how wonderful our God is. And then he continues on, uh, For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness, neither misery, neither good nor bad. And so, and I guess this is kind of the, the crux of what, what I wanted to share today is that opposition is good. It, it's, we, we, in our society, we think of it as, oh, no, opposition. You know, we, we, shut, we cancel the cancel culture. We shut down voices that don't agree with us. You know, we, we try to isolate ourselves into this little world of, you know, where everything is or happy, you know. But the reality of it is, is that opposition is kind of what makes the good world go around. It's what makes the plan of salvation work. Um, and so I want to show you some other scriptures in relation to this. Um, <clears throat> I know you all have read these scriptures. This, uh, this scripture here actually appears in all three of the books. Um, and this is, this, this is actually out of Malachi, but it's quoted by Jesus in the Book of Mormon. So he says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. So let's break this down a little bit, because there's a lot here. So the refiner's fire. So 
I don't know of any, I don't think any of us here work in refining metal or anything, right? I don't, I've never done it. I've watched TV shows with it, but never actually done it myself. But from what I read, the, the silver in particular, what they do is they, they burn the metal, they scrape off the, the part that's bad, they re, remelt it again, and then let it harden, they scrape off, and they keep doing this process where they're constantly scraping away this, this ugly. And the way that the refiner knows the silver is ready is because he can look into it and see the reflection of his face. And so here's Jesus, who is a ref, like a refiner's fire, who's constantly working on us, putting us through the crucible of, of, of suffering, scraping away the sins and the layers and trying to bring us to humility until the point where he can look into us and he can see his own face. When, when he sees the Savior, when he sees us, he sees himself. And then the second part of that um, is the fuller soap. And I'll, my next slide, I'll talk about that. But, but before I do, let's go here. It says, and he shall sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. What's that talking about? What, what's the sons of Levi? What's that all about? Priests, right. So the sons of Levi, the Levitical people, the Levitical priests, were, they were the ones that did all the sacrifice in the temple, right? And so the tribe of Levi, well, that was who did it in the days of Moses. And so they had to perform these sacrifices, and every time they did it, that was, that was the purification of Israel. It was symbolic of the purification of Israel. Well, now that Jesus has come, now we don't have to do those sacrifices anymore of, of animals. Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice. And so he was that refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. So now they're, they're not going to be able to do anything of their own. It, it's done by him. He's the ultimate high priest, the ultimate sacrifice. And he's both the lamb and the high priest. He is the high priest, but he's also the sacrificial lamb. He did everything. Um, <clears throat> And then it says, then the offering of Judah. So after Christ died, then the offering of Judah, which is Jesus, and Jerusalem will be pleasant unto the Lord. So it's finally acceptable because he did it himself. So let's talk just for a second about the fuller. So if, if you remember the verse that said, uh, he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Okay, well, a, a fuller was an ancient dry cleaner. Fullers were, were people that would take wool, they mostly wore wool, they would take wool clothing, and they had a process where they would basically make it full again. That's why they called them fullers, you know, it's like they, they refreshed material. And so they, the Jews were actually known for their ability with fullers, I mean, as fullers. They would, it was like a secret. They had, they had like an alkali special secret recipe that they used to, you know, of chemicals and stuff that they made to bring these cloths back to being new and fresh again. Uh, and it was actually, there was a whole lot of, the, the, the cloth suffered a lot because of it. Not only the chemicals, but they would hang them up and they'd take these bully, these clubs, and they called them fuller's clubs. And they would beat the material for long periods of time, shaking loose all the fibers and the dirt in them and all that and trying to like puff it up. Um, in fact, I can't remember, I didn't look it up, I can't remember which one it was, but one of, our, one of the apostles was beaten to death with a fuller's club uh, in, the, in the New Testament. <clears throat> um, but anyway, I wanted to show you this. This is just kind of a little side note. This place right here was found in, I believe it was 1982, and they couldn't figure out what it was because they had all these V's in it. They were like, what, what is this? And um, they, they actually found that it is an actual, an ancient fuller's um, like building or whatever. And in these V's, they had these stands that would sit and hold the fabric because of the way they did their processing. And so, and they've actually, since they found this one, they've found a couple other ones around the city. And so, I mean, whenever they find these and they see the V's cut in the rock, they know, oh, there's a fuller, you know, that's a place where a fuller worked, you know. Um, I thought that was kind of an interesting little tidbit. Oh, and actually, they actually had, like, there was like a trough of water that would run. They actually had running water would run down into the fuller's area. It was a constant stream of water. They'd divert the river or whatever. And so that's another thing. They were trying to figure out, why is water running into these places where all these V's are? And they were just trying to figure out what it was. And that's because the fuller used that water constantly for his processing. 
So. Okay, so I found this this morning um, as I was preparing, and, and I haven't noticed this scripture before. I don't know why I had never read it before, but I um, thought this was really interesting. You know, we talk about restoration. We talk about the restoration movement. And this scripture in Alma, it actually defines what is the restoration. It says right here, And now, my son, all men that are in a state of nature, or I would say in a carnal state, so that's us, are in the gall of bitterness. And in the bonds of iniquity, they are without God in the world, and they have gone contrary to the nature of God. Therefore, they are in a state contrary to the nature of happiness. And now, behold, is the meaning of the word restoration. To take a thing of a natural state and place it in, a natural, in an unnatural state, or to place it in a state opposite to its nature. So he's saying, is the meaning of the word restoration, does that mean... To take something in its in its uh, in its natural state and move it into its to an unnatural state is that what restoration means? That's what he's asking. He says, "Oh my son, this is not the case, but the meaning of the word restoration is to bring back again evil for evil, or carnal for carnal, or devilish for devilish, good for that which is good, righteous for that which is righteous, just for that which is just, merciful for that which is merciful." which doesn't make sense, right, when you just read that. So now you keep going. Therefore, my son, see that ye are merciful unto your brethren. Deal justly. So in other words, he's saying right here, it's it's not going to turn something that's natural into something that's unnatural. It's not going to change, like, completely opposite of what it is as far as being restored in the restoration. What it is 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 that in this life, if you are merciful to others, you're going to have mercy. If you're loving to others, you're going to have, you're going to have love. You're going to be loved. You know, there, in other words, so I'll keep going. It says, unto your brethren, deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. And if you do all these things, you shall receive your reward. Yea, you shall have mercy restored unto you again. Ye shall have justice restored unto you again. Ye shall have a righteous judgment restored unto you again. And ye shall have good rewarded unto you again. For that which ye do send out shall return unto you again and be restored. Uh, and so this right here, this, this explains our part in this scenario. Christ came and paid the price. You know, he died on the cross. He, he's the atonement for our sins. But our part is that we have to put forth an effort in dealing justly with others, being merciful with others, showing forth that what, what the way we want to be judged, we need to judge others. And, you know what I mean? We need to give forth that grace to others. Um, and, and that's what restoration is, being restored back into his presence from a fallen state because we gave mercy, therefore mercy comes to us. We give grace, grace comes back to us. You know, it's, it's, this, it's our step in the process, or our part of the process. And if anybody has any comments, please feel free to raise your hand or, you know, just speak up. Um, <clears throat> so temptations are good. And, we, and I think we need to, I think we think of temptations as something bad. You say, oh, temptations, it's evil, you know, avoid temptations. But they can be good if you respond correctly, of course. Um, but here it says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now, the inspired version just as full disclosure says, when you fall into many afflictions. Similar, similar way to say it. Um, personally, I like the idea of the, the, the fact that temptations puts ownership on me, on how I respond. When, he, when it says with, what Joseph put in is fallen into many afflictions, that sounds more like you're a victim, you know, it just happened to you. Um, but either way, uh, knowing this, the trying of your faith work is, worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so we're supposed to be happy when things come our way. And that's hard to do when, I'm, when things are challenging, you know, like losses of health or losses of, you know, family members or losing a job or, you know, there's so many things that we suffer in this life. Some are big and huge. Some of them are, you know, just day-to-day minor, you know, hangnails, you know. But we have to look. If we're trying to... If we're trying to grow spiritually, we have to learn to look at these things as wonderful. 
You know, like, for example, in my own life, you know, my divorce I went through with my ex-wife, you know, she cheated, and it was just a horrible, horrible experience. Devastating to my children, devastating to me. You know, it was just in, in every way devastating. But I can look back and I can say, thank you, Lord, because it woke me up. It, it was something I needed spiritually in my life. It, it showed me that I need to rely on him, that I can't just rely on my own strength. I'm not going to make it through without him. You know, and it brought me to my knees. I mean, I was near suicidal the, from the pain of what that caused. But that crucible that he put me through is what helped me to grow to the next level, you know, to become better than what I was. Um, and so we need to look at those things in that way. Um, I know, like... And I'll pick Jeff, for example. I know he's struggling right now with, it, with his daughter and her choices, you know, for going to Idaho. And that's a horrible, horrible, frustrating thing for a dad. But it, it's, if we can look at it from the Lord's perspective, we'll see it as a blessing, either for, for you guys as parents or for her. You know, because now, you know, she's gonna get, she may suffer because of what's her choice that she made. You know, and it's going to be tough. She's not going to have you guys nearby for support. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And it's going to be a challenge. You know, it's going to challenge your faith too. You know, and so these are all, these are all things that we need to look at. If we, if we step away and we look at it from the Lord's perspective, they're good things that, that will bring about good, good change if we are responding to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, and, I'm, and I'm right there with you, Jeff. I've got a son who's got a criminal record now, so I'm not happy about that either, but... Um, he is the Lord's, and, and we just have to keep moving forward, you know. And then uh, the running, with, running this, this race with patience uh, says, Nevertheless, the Lord seeth fit to chasten his people. It doesn't say chasten the wicked, does it? Or the Gentiles, or whatever else you want to say. It's chasten his people. Yea, he trieth their patience and their faith. Nevertheless, whoso putteth his trust in him, the same shall be lifted up at the last day. And that's that crucible that we get put through. So fiery trials are good. 1 Peter 4 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And that all really depends on how we react, how we respond to situations when they come about. You know, if, if you, know, you just get informed that you're fired by your job, you know, you, can, you, you have a choice. Right in that moment, you have a choice. You can be mad. You can throw a temper tantrum. You can you know, throw your computer against the wall and say, I hated this job anyway, and walk out mad. That would be a reaction, right? Or you can say, okay, no problem, and go home and pray and ask the Lord, okay, what now, Lord? You know, I, you know, I'm in your hands. I know I don't, I don't have an income now, but I'm in your hands. And what's, what's next for me? Thank you for this. Thank you for what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but thank you. And now... What's next? You know, and I always think about like Abinadi. You know, Abinadi, poor Abinadi. <laughs> you know, he's told by the Lord to go and preach to the people, and he does. He calls them to repentance, and nobody responds. I mean, imagine going before a, a group of your people that you love and telling them to repent and, and trying to bring them closer to God, and they all reject you. You know, they, they all wanted him dead. People were mad, the 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 uh, King Noah was mad. The priests were mad. Everybody's mad at him. And so they kill him. And there he is burning alive, you know, and he's still prophesying. He prophesied that King Noah would die the same death that he was dying. You know, but, but look at what happened. I mean, that was a, that's a crucible right there, you know. And, and really, it didn't, it didn't do anything for him personally, but look what it did for Alma. You know, he... It says in the scriptures that he sealed the truth of his words with his life. You know, and so it changed Alma. It changed Alma, and he was a new person. And, uh, and of course, you, if you know the story, it, of course, blossomed from there, and the church grew, and, you know, it was a beautiful thing. But it was all because of Benedi 
was willing to suffer. It, yeah. It also reminds you of Stephen and Saul in the same kind of situation. Yeah. That even though Saul's conversion was later, that worked on him that whole time until that happened. Yeah. Yeah, Paul's a wonderful example. Yep. Yep. And, you know, it's interesting. Even after Paul was converted, it says that he had a thorn in his flesh, thorn in his side, and it remained there. You know, I always wonder what that meant, you know, if it was something physical or, you know, if he had some... It could be, a, it could be something, that, a temptation that worked on him all Could the have time. been, yeah. I think we all have thorns like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and God didn't remove it. I think he left it there. I think Paul had a... Paul seemed like a, based on the way I read it, it sounded like he was kind of a type A personality and very opinionated, and he probably needed that to keep him, keep him humble, a reminder. Yeah. Okay, so this is out of 2 Timothy. Persecution is a good thing. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're being persecuted for Jesus, then that's a good thing. Because that means that, that you're living godly. It says, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. For evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All right, so now um, I'm going to shift it over a little bit and talk about how, how there's, there's hope. You know, we don't have to focus on the, the suffering or on the trials or on the opposition, but also focus on the fact that the Lord loves us so much. And it says, and now, and now, as I said unto you, that because you were compelled to be humble, and this is out of Alma, because you were compelled, now, now, now give you some backdrop here, this is the story of Korahor. Remember, Korahor was this just really evil, evil guy that basically took over the church and had kicked out all the humble, poor people out of the church, and now they weren't even able to attend church because they didn't have nice enough clothes and all that. And so they're grieving, they're upset that they're, no, they're not allowed to worship in, at the synagogue. And Alma is giving them, you know, words of advice, words of love, counsel, and saying, you know, you, you know, don't think that because you're not in your synagogue, you can't worship God. Your relationship with God is not connected to that building, you know. And so, and then he explains to them this. He says, and now I say, now I said unto you that because you were compelled to be humble, you were blessed. Do you not suppose that they are more blessed who truly humble themselves because of the word? Yea, He that truly humbleth himself and repenteth of his sins and endureth to the end, the same be blessed. Yea, much more blessed than they who are compelled to be humble. So if those people of Alma, if they would have just chosen to be humble, say, well, we're kicked out of our synagogues, you know, and that's okay, Lord. We don't know exactly why, but we can worship you right here in our home, and we're just thankful that that you're our God, and... You know, they could have just chosen that humility rather than being upset about having been kicked out and, you know, more that they were like forced into humility. Um, and I think sometimes that's the case with us. You know, we sometimes we make bad choices and the Lord has to humble us and we end up in this terrible suffering that maybe we wouldn't have had to suffer had we not made that choice in the first place and just chosen to be humble, chosen to serve him. Um, you know, like my like my son, for example. He could have chosen not to commit crime and get himself in trouble. You know, God may still humble him. He may still, he's not lost. He's just wayward right now. And, you know, God may, may compel him to be humble. But how much more blessed would it have been had he just chosen to serve God and be humble in the first place? And that really needs to be our, our goal. Um, Therefore, blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. So there is a better option than being, being compelled to it. Um, and then this is out of Romans, that Christ makes intercession for us. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. 
to them who are called according to his purpose. And again, that just goes back to that we don't see the big picture. You know, that whatever we're suffering in this moment, we don't see the big picture. We don't know how that's going to work for our good, but we know that it is if we love God. Um, and we can take uh, comfort in knowing that. And then this is in out of Second Corinthians. Um, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And this is kind of an interesting idea. In our world, the strong survive, right? The strong are the ones that get the promotion at work. The strong are the ones that, you know, the, that get, the, get the pretty girl in school. You know, I mean, it's the strong and the, you know, the, the manly man, the chiseled jaw. Those are the ones that are, you know, the, the successful men, right? But God doesn't, doesn't do that. If you look in Scripture, he takes, the, he takes people like Moses, you know, had a speech impediment and didn't want to go in front of the people and he was, saw himself as weak and why me, Lord? You know, why, why, why choose me? Um, and he uses, he uses fishermen and he uses tax collectors and he uses, you know, he uses all these weak, just kind of average Joes that don't have high learning, don't have, you know, um, the, the respect of men. He uses all the weak things to, uh, to, to perform his, his uh, work. Um, it says, For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, I, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And um, this is my last slide, but, and I think this is one that is important, and that is that we have to help each other. You know, this, this journey, this is one of the beautiful things about the journey of, towards Christ, is that he's established this principle of not, you don't have to be alone in the journey. You know, Christ is with, Christ is with you, and, and not only that, but he he gives, he sends people in our lives to help us along that path. Um, there's this, I've mentioned this girl before, her name's Monica, um, and, and I, she was actually on the podcast that one, one time, if you guys watched that, but, um, you know, this is a girl that grew up completely 100% LDS. I mean, family was LDS, parents were LDS, yeah, she married a guy who was an LDS, she has like six kids, you know, married in the temple, did all the temple ordinance stuff, I mean, 100%, she wears the undergarment, 100% LDS. And yet the Lord is waking her up. He, woke, he started waking her up, realizing, wait a minute, you know, polygamy is a sin and all these different things. And God began waking her up. And so, and then he started putting people in her path to help her along that journey. You know, she, she found us on, on YouTube, you know, and we began communicating. She's communicated with a few other people too that are helping, that are kind of showing her you know, kind of helping sharpen her, you know, she's the iron sharp with iron. So in other words, you know, two pieces of the same material can actually sharpen each other, just like iron sharpens iron. You know, it's not to say that I have any more truth than she does. It's not to say that I'm any better than she is. God, God is the one that changes hearts. But he uses each of us to help each other, you know, if we'll respond. Um, and so, and that's another thing I think we tend to, we, maybe we forget sometimes you know, that we tend to get more competitive or we tend to get more, you know, oh, I got this. Or, you know, we wear our Sunday best to church, but then we don't really share with each other what's going on in our lives or the struggles that we're having or, you know, because maybe we don't want to admit our weakness or, or we assume, well, everybody else is more righteous than me. I'll just keep this to myself, you know. But yet we're all in the same boat. We're all iron and we all need to be sharpened. And so that's a principle that God has given. Um, so that's basically all I had. Um, hopefully, I, I don't. Hopefully, these scriptures uh, maybe make you look at it differently. But I know in my life, when I've had suffering in the past, I have, uh, you know, you know, it's easy to feel sorry for yourself, and that really is not what God wants us to do. Feeling sorry for ourselves is giving in to Satan. It's letting him win. What we need to do instead is we need to turn it around and say, "Thank you, Lord. I don't know what you're doing, but thank you." I know that's going to do something because I love you.
you know, and, and I think if we could change our perspective and do that, I think it would make a difference in our, in our lives. Thank you.